Will machines ever run man? This is a question that is equivalent to, uh, to wondering whether we can ever uh, make machines that will break the thought barrier. I don't really know, but I do know that if we, uh, if we are able to make a machine which is capable of emulating human thinking, is capable of self-reproduction, is capable of improving itself, well, I, I hope that the man who does this has the presence of mind to kick the plug out of the socket before he runs. This is J. Presper Eckert, co-inventor of ENIAC and vice president of UNIVAC Division's Ferry Ran Corporation. As we know, uh, ever since the human race came into existence, men always had some kind of knowledge about the world and themselves, which enabled them to survive in what are often difficult, if not hostile, environments. And for many centuries, many thousands of years, men acquired uh, a certain know-hows, such obvious things, for example, as being able to walk, uh, the use of a fire, the use of a wheel in order to drag heavy objects, the use of a pulley. These things, where the origin is lost in the beginnings of historic time, uh, enabled men to achieve a great deal by way of establishing a some kind of a civilization. This is Ernest Nagel, uh, professor of philosophy at Columbia University and a prominent figure in the effort to re-establish the unity of science that, uh, and philosophy. For the most part, these uh, habits, well, as long as men remained in a certain kind of environment or the environment didn't change, but that uh, as soon as some fresh problem arose, the traditional habits no longer served to enable men to achieve even a moderate kind of existence. Yesterday's fantasies of other worlds and machines like men are today's reality. The trouble with science fiction is that it's all too real. If you suggest to a child today that uh, uh, we are going to be able to go to the moon and back, uh, that we're going to be able to uh, write music with machines, uh, be able to paint pictures uh, with machines, that we'll be able to uh, transfer our bodies through space and recreate them at another point. Uh, they're not stunned. They're, they, they, uh, they view this type of science fiction as clearly derivable out of the world in which they live. This is Dr. C.R. DiCarlo, Director of Education for the International Business Machines Corporation. Uh, the essence of, of, this, of this environment is that the key is, is the information in the system rather than the energy. Because of this, our kids are willing to accept almost anything as possible. Of course, this gives, a, this gives us a problem in that uh, we become at once very uh, blasé about the most exciting events on the one hand, on the other, we, we develop a ready expectation of, of the good life uh, with no effort. It, it, it's as though you simply put the crank in, spend enough dollars, and if you want a trip to the moon, your ticket should be ready uh, in a matter of hours. Roger, understand go for at least seven orbits. 
but the key is the information in the system rather than the energy. Information, which implies the power of understanding the parts and forces that operate within a system so that we may predict possible outcomes, control the system, and perhaps design a better one. There are many situations in the contemporary world where the sheer amount of information and the speed at which it must be handled simply exceed the tolerances and capacities of the human nervous system. Yet it may be that our very survival depends upon our ability to accumulate and to use wisely information concerning ourselves and our rapidly changing environment. Through its ability to process information and to serve as an extension of our logical and decision-making powers, the computer has become the indispensable tool of the modern age. The things we can't do on a computer are the things that we, we do subconsciously. There's even another case, they're the things we can't do at all either. But uh, we do many things subconsciously in some unexplainable way, and, and in fact to us it seems almost muddled way underneath it all, and then we, we come out uh, with the, the results of this thinking, and it takes us a while to understand what we've come out with. Uh, once we do bring these things out on the table and understand them, then we have no trouble explaining them to other people. We also have no trouble putting them on computers then. I think you can make the assertion that any phenomenon involving data and logic or purpose can be at least helped, implemented, or amplified through the use of information technology. And this is why I think we've, we've come to accept the notion today that practically anything is possible. A statement to the effect that anything is possible immediately raises the social and ethical question as to what within the infinite range of possibility is desirable and for whom. Obviously, any product of science and any tool, be it a stone hammer, a steam engine, an atomic reactor, or a computer, can be used and misused. Yet there are those who claim that there is something inherently destructive in the works of modern science and that science and technology are responsible for the most critical problems faced by the modern world. This responsibility, I suppose, cannot be denied. On the other hand, uh, many of the criticisms of science as being the source of our contemporary evils are on par with respect to their relevance uh, and with respect to their force to saying that it is marriage which is the cause of divorce, since if we weren't married, uh, we wouldn't have the problem of divorce. As I see it, we are, uh, we're embedded in a, in a, in a new world, in, in a new world of technology, at least, at least in this country and probably in Western Europe, although I'm no expert in, in, in this field. But it does seem to me that we are embedded in a, in a world where technology is completely pervasive. And, and, and some people seem to think we're almost subordinate to technology. Certainly, science has made it possible for us to develop instrumentalities of various kinds. We have, alas, misused many of them, or used them for what would be generally acknowledged to be iniquitous purposes. But to blame science for this is not to distribute the blame correctly. Uh, without science, many of our contemporary horrors certainly would not have come into being, but it isn't science alone which uh, must shoulder the responsibility for this, but rather all of us who do not know how to use uh, the inventiveness of man for satisfactory purposes. Uh, we realize now that a person to participate in this technological world has to be educated and trained to a certain minimum point in order to survive as a healthy functioning individual. Uh, these are changes which are, are, are quite pervasive and, and in a sense radical that have taken place and they suggest uh, concomitant changes or social inventiveness is going to be required in other, uh, in other activities in which we're engaged. And I believe that they all have their their basis in the uh, development 
of this information technology because it's here that we've been able to uh, bring our past experience to bear to do a better job in designing uh, and a better job in the production of things. The great problem before us, as I see it, is how to, uh, to establish the ends now that we have the scientific means to create such a, a wondrous world in the world of things. I think it's uh, much more important to think of science not simply as an instrument for developing these obvious uh, material goods, but to think of science as I think has always been part of the tradition within the scientific community as an agency which succeeds in emancipating the human mind from ignorance, error, and from superstition. I'll grant that at the same time, the means, the technology, if you will, the mass communication, mass uh, media, the, the advertising, the uh, television, uh, the closeness, uh, the togetherness of living in an urban society it makes it difficult for the individual to remain an individual and make this assessment. Our problem in education is to increase the probability that he will exercise choice, he will exercise thought, but observe he's at least in a position to do it. To me, this is the the one great benefit that has come out of the science as a means to a better physical life. It puts the individual in a position to assess who he is, where he wants to go, how he wants to contribute. He may be very passive, but he at least has the chance. It is the replacement of men by machines, automation, that is frequently singled out as the most immediate problem brought on by technological change. I do not think it's, it's, a, it's a situation which which uh, solves itself automatically. For example, I think there's a danger that, that all progress, whether, whether we make people live longer through medicine and, and as a result have more people to support from the working group, or whether we use more automation and computers, all progress is going to create an unemployment problem. I think the computer is one of the best tools we have to do some planning and try to get out of this unemployment problem. I don't think it's a situation which solves itself automatically. In the farms, in the last 35 or 40 years, in the United States, we have gone down to 40% of the number of farmers and now turn out two and a half times as much food. In other words, we turn out five times as much food per man on a farm now as we did 35 or 40 years ago. This has created unemployment problems on the farm. And we've solved this problem on the farm by giving subsidies. But if we make improvements like we have in automation on the farm in all areas of our work, where are the subsidies going to come from to substitute, to subsidize everything? You can't subsidize everything from everything else. And therefore, I think we have, have to solve these problems in the future and not just pretend that they're, that they're self-equalizing or self-solving. They don't seem to be. I think we have before us several uh, important uh, decisions to make. Uh, number, number one is with the increasing amount of productivity. Uh, in our physical plant, how shall we operate to guarantee the greatest number of things and services uh, to people? Uh, should we try to work fewer hours and have more people work? Uh, should we try to find uh, new products, new markets, and new services to take up the increase in productivity? Uh, should we uh, develop more concern for uh, new, new human uh, activities uh, such as a, an enormously increased uh, attention to education, uh, to culture, uh, that is uh, the things of a culture, music, uh, art. Uh, these types of decisions of the allocation of our energy and our resources, I think, underlie the current attention that's, that's being paid to the problem of automation and technological change uh, unemployment, uh, the uses of leisure time. But observe that under, underlying all of these problems is, is the concept of great gain in productivity through technology and the uses of those gains in attaining social purpose. Now, I think that the, it's inevitable that as we become bigger, as our people live closer together, 
that we're going to have the necessity for a more planful consideration of the introduction into change. This is the kind of problem that I think has to be brought out into the open in the public sector, discussed uh, with the consensus of the people uh, coming up through political leadership with all of us accommodating ourselves and our various views to the greatest good. And I see as a result of this process a, a great deal more of thoughtful and planned action on the part of society, not only the great corporations, the labor unions, uh, the government, but on all of our institutions. We have to become more concerned about our desire to predict and control and amplify and make better the future in which we're going to live. Of course, a great deal of the future will depend upon what commands we give our machines and what questions we ask them. Loom. Sweep. Check. And what about computers that adapt to their environment and, in a sense, learn from experience? Dr. Richard Hemming of the Bell Telephone Laboratories questions Larry Roberts of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology about a machine learning experiment. How are you people approaching this learning problem? Well, we're worried about the problem of pattern classification. Now, if you wanted to separate the letters of the alphabet, one from another with a machine, you'd have to develop all sorts of rules to separate them. O is completely closed, B has two closed areas. Now, you can state this one rule as one, and you can state many more rules, which are going to separate them all. Uh, we're worried about speech recognition here. Uh, I'm sure you'd find it very hard to separate, to write down all the rules to separate various speech patterns. Mm -hmm. And so, we have to have the machine do some of this work for us. We try and give it a method for generating its own rules, and uh, by this method, we are able to classify patterns by giving it instances of each pattern. We give it, say, five A's, and five B's, and five C's, and it teaches it which is which, and then it should be able to develop rules for classifying A's the same and separating them from B's. Well, as I see, this is a rather sophisticated proposal. You are not giving the machine the rules, you're giving the machine the method. And the machine will find the rules for making distinction. That's right. Uh, the m rules themselves may be just uh, represented in terms of numbers in the machine, but the machine has to interpret them and change them as you get new input. So here we have a program which improves with age. That is, the more it sees, the better it does. And it develops better rules for separating the patterns. Wouldn't this be rather time consuming on the machine to carry out such a program? Well, we see how long it takes humans. It takes about 10 or 20 years before they've learned too much by teaching. So we hope to install enough by our knowledge directly so they can learn and improve faster than normal teaching. But we expect it to take 10 or 20 years like the human does to really get fairly far along. Another research effort in machine learning is the famous checker playing experiment being conducted by Professor A.L. Samuel of IBM. I'm interested in the problem of machine learning. This is an attempt to write a program which causes a computer to improve its performance as a result of its experience. Uh, since it is quite difficult to do this in a real life situation, I have chosen the game of checkers. This is a program which causes the computer to play checkers and to profit from its playing experience so that with time it plays a better and better game of checkers. Now, I can demonstrate this. I just made the move one to five. I enter this move, instruct the computer as to this move by entering two keys and pushing a start button, which causes the computer to accept the move and print it on the printer. It then is computing, and uh, these lights are flickering, it is computing its best move on the basis of this information. When it has completed this move, this light comes on, showing that it stopped 
and the move will be displayed on these numbers, which duplicate the numbers appearing on the board. It has moved. Its move was 29.25. I enter its move, 29.25. Obviously, we hope that in the long-range future, we can use these same principles in real-life situations. At the moment, this is a pure research problem. However, it is not unreasonable to think that in many situations, we will be able to apply these free problems. In a speech presented during a session on the computer of the future held at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Norbert Wiener, Institute Professor Emeritus, made this comment about learning machines. Don't suppose for a moment, at least I don't, I'm not naive enough to suppose that the International Business Machines Corporation made this machine to play checkers. It made this machine as a working model of decision-making machines. The fact that that machine can defeat the man that programmed it, even if he can catch up with it later, means that the fact that you've made such a machine does not give you completely effective control over it. If you had that, you would not have let it beat you. Now, this is very important. Such a machine in certain decision situations can be very useful. Such machines could conceivably be used to play other games than checkers, the business game, the war game, the game of determining when to press the button for Armageddon, for the thermonuclear war. The situation of man and the computer has been described as man's first encounter outside himself with something that is exactly like some inside part of himself. And what does this mean with respect to man's view of himself? Dr. Richard Hemming commented. The, the intellectual aspect of the computer revolution, which is far more important in the long run than material aspects, is going to change our view of the world, our view of ourselves. I think this is far more important than the fact that the machine will also change the way we live. And the change may go even deeper into an understanding of the life process itself. In the past two decades, we've seen some brilliant work in interpreting the nature of the cell as a, an information machine. Uh, geneticists, microbiologists are beginning to use the same ideas, constructs, and words that we use in the computer field. And this isn't to suggest that the computer can either unravel the life secret or can duplicate it or can control it. It does suggest, however, that an understanding of the life process can profit by taking operational ideas from information theory and information technology and applying them uh, to, to the life process. I uh, personally am persuaded that no matter how deeply uh, we probe, and no matter how uh, arduously we try to uh, duplicate and are successful in duplicating certain parts of the life process, that there will always be uh, some new level of fineness or resolution uh, beyond us. In other words, the enigma will always uh, be there. The enigma of life itself exceeds only the enigma of how to live a life meaningfully and to the fullest the enigma of how to adapt to and how to shape the circumstances of life we have inherited and of life we have created. Have we the wisdom for survival? There is one of our creations, the computer, which has no wisdom whatsoever of its own, but has great ability to follow what we instruct it to follow. This machine may free us a little from routines that we may develop wisdom. It may show us, abstractly, the logical consequences of actions which may help us to act more wisely. It may help us to use the past with greater wisdom in the service of the present. And it may help us to teach the young that they may grow beyond us in wisdom. I view technology as at once a, a crushing weight on the individual, but on the other hand, an enormous opportunity to understand himself and to reflect uh, and assess where he wants to go. At the same time, realize that he has to 
uh, fight the battle within himself to remain a biological mechanism. Uh, I guess the the individual uh, today is is faced a little bit with the uh, the fear of admitting or facing his own existence uh, because it is a it's a lonely world in one sense the the, the existence of technology and, and things uh, an environment which seems to be so impersonal uh, to use the, the favorite word alienates the individual it is a lonely uphill battle to be alert and perceptive to the world and yet I think it's the most noble battle as it always has been in, in uh, in history, the, uh, all the way back to the to the Greeks, uh, the phrase "the unexamined life isn't worth living." Well, this was a phrase that was made in in uh, in, in Athens when there were very few people that could even afford examination. Uh, so, for most of pe people in Athens, life life by definition wasn't worth living. Today, at least, the opportunity to examine life is is available to practically all of our citizens. Uh, I think. Uh, the, the, ex the expression I like to, to uh, conjure with here, co uh, I remember is uh, from Ortega. Is it, I think he said that, uh, that life is, 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 is petty and unless it's moved by an indomitable urge uh, to extend its, its boundaries. That, that only when, when we live more, when we desire to live more, are we really living at all. And it's this outer tension, the, the, the outer desire, the, the desire to participate, and at the same time to be introspe introspective, to me seems to be the heart of the educational problem in our culture. As I say, it's, a, it's a, a problem that's made enormously difficult by technology, mass communications, and all of the, the things that we look at negatively. And yet it's these negative means which enable us to have the opportunity for individual assessment. Now, whether we have the courage and the time and the energy to use the opportunity we have, I think, is the, is the great problem. Thanks also to NASA and to the MIT Press for the statement by Norbert Wiener, which appears in the book Management and the Computer of the Future. This is NET, National Educational Television.